Welcome back to the Ephemeris Podcast. I'm your host, Ophelian, and I'm feeling good once again. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that at the beginning of the episode, but um, always coming back to the mic and recording a podcast is fun, so I'm probably going to say that more times than I intend to. But anyways, um, some of the academic stress I had before this episode is kind of gone now, so I'm kind of happy about that, and hopefully that means more content creation on my part. Also, I do hope to boost the content creation in the summer, not necessarily in terms of frequency, but probably just like actually like getting ahead of schedule with um, just episodes on episodes being already recorded and ready to publish, so... Yeah, basically what I mean is like I'm not going to miss episode uploads in the summer because I'm just going to be going hard on the podcast episode creation. But anyways, that's enough about that. Today's topic is Chinese cosmology. And um, as far as the outlook goes for the next couple of episodes, it seems to be I'll be covering ancient Eastern cosmology and maybe... A little bit of um, some of the civilizations in South America before I get into mostly Western theory and we're going to dive into the Greeks and their models and all that jazz. So uh, today's episode is a continuation of some of the ancient Eastern cosmology we've been looking at. And to begin, let's begin with some context. Uh, The earliest traces of ancient Chinese civilization were from the 25th century BCE and contrarily it is not the Xia dynasty that it began with, but the Ta, the Ta, the, sorry, I'm uh, tripping up on the pronunciation of this. The Taoist period that came in the, it came earlier than the 20th century and preceded the Xia. So, um, kind of knowledge about the Taoist period came a lot more recently. So, uh, I think. Most of us learned that Xia Dynasty was the first, but I guess based on some of the newer stuff that's come out, it seems there's a Taoist period, which means you're able to date back the Chinese civilization a little further, so 25th century BCE. And uh, more importantly, by the middle to late Taoist period, archaeologists found platforms that suggested that ancient Chinese of the near 2nd millennium BCE were making solar observations, which I mean... Probably a, uh, a curiosity that's going to develop in humans at some point. So um, not very interesting up until that point. But um, what's more interesting is the fact that they built solar platforms for this, which had their azimuth aligned with the range that the sun rose and set from across the year, which is pretty interesting. I have to say. Um, Hold on, I kind of lost track here. Yeah, so these platforms that they were used, they're more notorious, I believe, for like sacrificial stuff. But archaeologists archaeologists suggest that because of how it was aligned, that um, it could have been used to observe the sunrise, the sunset locations, like all across the year, even on the solstices. So, yeah. On top of that, they had solar altars, or they, yeah, I think it's, yeah, solar altars, and they rose more than 20 meters high with the Hui style of build. And basically what that means is they used, like, around about, like, 1,424 earthen platforms. They, like, uh, built, you know, they built, like, blocks almost with these platforms, and it was in, like, the round, and it was in a round and square shape which is what they're referring to when they say the Hui style, because the Hui character in Chinese kind of kind of looks like that, right? And basically, they took these, these blocks of earthen platforms, and they stacked them on top of each other and made a tower. And these things could cover 28,000 square kilometers of area in terms of view, which is really crazy. Like, we're not even talking... Second millennium BCE now we're talking before that and they already had things that were like that are made out of earth Almost like more than 20 meters high. They could cover a lot of land. So That is very very impressive and additionally these observations also presumably led to the Chinese using horizon calendars which is backed up by some uh, historical documents namely 
one that's called The Classics of Mountains and Seas. And um, just as a little side note, uh, it is um, a true Chinese mythology behind Shang-Chi and the Ten Rings. So if that rings a bell, perhaps that's going to help you realize that, oh, wow, it looks like... Um, uh, this classical uh, document was found the foundation for some important mythology, but it also had some stuff in there that we can use to kind of say, oh, well, it looks like they used the horizon calendar because it's um, a lot of the astrology and mythology in there is going to be based on uh, probably things that they saw in the sky, the sun, the stars, all of that good stuff. So moving on, the Chinese were also close observers of a dragon constellation that pretty much perfectly reflected the progression of the season and the crops to the point that the movement of the constellation across the sky paralleled the maturity of the crops they were growing. So, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Like, basically what they did was they found these patterns that um, resembled to them what is a very um, significant uh, creature in their culture, the dragon. And it was so perfectly picked out that when they saw these group of stars just progress across the sky it's like it told you about uh how far into the growing season the crops were so uh yeah that's another really really cool thing about some of the observations that the ancient chinese did and one thing that um comes through or shines through with a lot of uh eastern um kind of Eastern practices is how good their polar alignment was and that holds true for the ancient Chinese it, Theirs were so good that their architecture was longitudinally based and Alongside that as we commonly know Chinese culture was heavily based on the astronomical patterns they saw so that's kind of the list of astronomical observations they did um, what kind of significant things came out of it, like solar platforms, solar towers, like Chinese mythology and astrology with, you know, you're talking about the dragon constellation and, you know, uh, figuring out constellations that um, aligned with the agricultural season. So that's quite a lot. That's, um, that's quite a lot. And one of the research papers that I was reading talked about this a little bit where they were like, their, their polar alignment and their, like, predictions for where the poles were at was so good but they they made it a point that they actually didn't use it to its fullest extent which says something about how good their observations were i guess in a little bit i didn't dig too deep into like why they thought they didn't use their um, observations and measurements to the fullest extent and how they could have but it was something that was mentioned in the research paper that I was reading for the research of this episode. And a cool excerpt that came out of that, that I think is going to transition us into a little bit of the cosmological stuff, is this. So basically what they said is, The early Chinese synthesis of the complementary aspects of time and space into an all-embracing fabric of a casual pattern orderness derives its inspiration from the most ancient everyday crafts of cordage and weaving, in brackets, the latter exclusively women's work in ancient times. The metaphors fundamental to their cosmovision, the making of the starry images above and the socializing patterns of the life world below all derive from that earliest, most vital industry. If we return now to the theme with, with which we began, which the research paper is referring to, um, some of the stuff that I talked about above. Ancient Chinese perceptions of time and temporality, rather than thinking in terms of cyclical or linear time, it would seem that the con conception is recursive in inspiration. Recursion is a process in which elements or processes repeat in a self-similar way. A familiar illustration would be when two mirrors are placed facing each other producing nested images that form an infinite recursion. Recursion is intrinsic to the art of weaving, of course, and at some level also the idea of generating a cosmos from binary or quinquinary elemental forces, as in the Book of Changes. So, pretty long excerpt, but basically what they're saying is that um, basically the quote-unquote industry that 
uh, the ancient Chinese made from doing all of these observations and measurements was a heavy influence and inspiration to a lot of the, uh, to basically ancient Chinese society, going from everyday crafts and um, kind of like, uh, where was it that they talked about it? Yeah, uh, socializing patterns of the life world below, which I assume they're referring to astrology there. So yeah, what the, the observations and measurements had a lot of influence on society at the time. And then the second paragraph goes on to talk about like, um, a little bit more of how the ancient Chinese perceived time. So it wasn't necessarily cyclical or linear that things just like, uh, you know, go in a line and um, certain things happen in a cycle or periodically. Uh, they thought more of there are elements and processes in the universe that just repeat in a self-similar way, but there's still a uniqueness to it. It's like um, basically the example that they brought up about uh, two mirrors facing each other, even though it creates infinite recursion, I mean, there's a little bit of uniqueness to each reflection in that sort of way. So, um, yeah, uh, that's basically what that excerpt is saying. Hopefully that's not too long of a summarization, but I just wanted to make sure um, it is understood what they were trying to say with that excerpt. And, um, how we can learn about how China, the ancient Chinese perceived time. And so, yeah, I think that's a good point to transition more into some of the cosmology of ancient China because so far we've talked about astronomical stuff. And a really nice way to understand the Chinese uh, perspective of, on the universe is to dive more into the religions they followed and what those religions said about the cosmos. Um, even though these religions came around like the 5th century BCE, which is really, really late, uh, considering that we're talking about the Talisa period being like way further back into the 2nd millennium BCE, I think a lot of those ideas about the cosmos uh, had to develop over time and probably came to fruition in the 5th century BCE, so it's still going to be significant under that assumption that they didn't just like say in the 5th BC, uh, 5th century BCE, oh yeah, we figured out suddenly. So the three main religions originating in ancient China were um, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. And for the sake of simplicity, I will not go into detail about Buddhism because their understanding of the universe has like um, kind of it's like three forms with like several different subsets, which you have to analyze very, very deeply. And that's, it's very complex. So I'm not going to um, go into that in this episode. And Confucianism, it's, uh, it doesn't reflect the beliefs of these, of, you know, uh, ancient, the ancient Chinese at the time as much as Taoism does from what I read. And I think some of the stuff that comes from Confucianism is going to slightly overlap with Taoism, so I'm just going to focus more on Taoism. And I, I think Taoism, even though we don't cover the other two religions, is going to um, give us uh, a, a great amount of insight no matter what. So yeah, let's get into it. Taoism, in terms of the cosmos, and similarly to Vedic cosmology, believed in quote-unquote the Tao, and basically I think the best way to imagine what the Tao is is just like the highest of highs, uh, the highest of higher powers, essentially, or at least presumably from what I understand, right? So basically, the Tao, the the one and only, the great, whatever you want to call it, but basically what it means is the highest of higher higher powers. Um, it's undefined yet definite, if that makes sense. So like, it was the one thing that defined everything. Hopefully that's making sense. Like, I don't know other ways to explain that. That's basically what I'm getting out of what they mean by the Tao, right? They also believe that it had three key components that were either manifested or unmanifested. So now we start to see the similarity to Vedic cosmology, right? They talked about the three gunas, and they talked about the manifested and unmanifested state. And as we know from the first episode, that does um, kind of reflect 
uh, the three fundamental forces of the universe we know today, gravitational, electromagnetic, and nuclear, right? But here, um, the Baos obviously being a very um, spiritual philosophy, their components were essence, called essence, breath, and spirit. So definitely a more spiritual approach. Um, I, don't, I don't think you can necessarily make a better connection of these three things to the fundamental forces as much as you can with Vedic cosmology, and I'll get into why that is in just a moment. So, but one thing I do want to mention on top of that is that these three things representing the progression of the universe is kind of more of the focus rather than like them representing uh, three fundamental forces of the universe, right? So they believed essence presided over tangible entities, spirit presided over intangible entities, and breath is what brought it all together. And these three things together brought the cosmos from emptiness and non-being into existence. So yeah, because because of what I just said, it's hard to create that connection between the three fundamental forces of the universe because they had a different idea of what each one did, right? Additionally, they believed that the Tao went from unity to duality to multiplicity to achieve the creation of the universe. So this is going to be a little bit less like the Vedic cosmology because they said you start with unmanifested unmanifested then you go unmanifested manifested and then you go manifested manifested right so this one is a little bit more of like um this i don't know the Tao, the one and only being like one and then becoming more and more and then it just created the universe so once the cosmos was born so that's that's all for the birth of the cosmos Taoists believed that things like the Big Dipper represented characteristics of the universe, such as the center and unity. Yin and Yang represented the duality of the universe, and that the universe had five agents, wood, fire, soil, metal, and water. Right? So basically, you can see here that a lot of the philosophical things that came out of Taoism, they're, they're um, kind of pertaining it to... Uh, the universe in a way hopefully that, that makes sense i don't know if that sentence even made sense but hopefully you're getting the idea but i want to talk about these five agents that i just talked about um wood fire soil metal and water so the ancient chinese actually historically named the planets in the solar system to represent these five agents so venus was the metal star jupiter was the wood star mercury was the water star Mars was the fire star, and Saturn is the soil star or earth star. I feel like it's better to call it the earth star. So these were the significant parts of Taoism that reflected cosmological thinking of the ancient Chinese, and along with other astronomical observations made by the ancient Chinese, that pretty much sums up ancient Chinese cosmology and astronomy, I should add. Um, I think the last episode, uh, episode about ancient eastern cosmology will probably come in come in the next week in the form of persian astronomy uh, i'm thinking about covering mayan stuff and kind of like central american south american civilization a little bit but yeah those are going to be the two episodes before we get into the greeks and the greeks are going to come around i think the first millennium bce from what i can recall kind of looking it up really quickly so yeah, that's that's the outlook again. I know I mentioned it in the beginning, but also just to expand on it a little bit here. And uh, yeah, I feel like today's episode was uh, a little bit short for sure. Uh, actually, never mind. I'm looking at the uh, the timestamp. It's 19 minutes, so it looks like I really elongated this thing. But um, yeah, I was because of how uh, short my notes were. I was thinking this was going to be a little bit of a a short one but it looks like not it looks like you got a decent amount of content hopefully you guys enjoyed the content for this week's episode if you did uh, make sure to hit the subscribe button if you're listening on youtube and make sure to follow me on spotify if you're listening there and until the next episode i will see you guys later peace